ready to get started whenever you all are ready. All righty. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, obviously, for uh, the ICANS community, I'm Ed Hoffman, uh, Academic Director for the Information Knowledge Strategy Program. This is our ICANS Academy Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm very, very, very excited about this one. Uh, we have John Zviokla, uh, who's going to be talking about the Bionic Company. Hello, John. Hello, Ed. How are you? I'm doing good. And um, I'm going to give a little background on John, and then uh, we'll get into some of the discussions. Again, uh, for this one, um, as you have questions, you have a chat box, and uh, we'll, we'll catch up on those. And Carolina is also here with us. Uh, so as a, as a setup to this, Dr. John Zviokla is a principal and U.S. advisory innovation leader with PwC. He also serves on PwC's advisory leadership group, the Global Thought Leadership Council, and leads the exchange, an ongoing think tank for PwC clients and world-class business leaders. Previously, he served as vice chairman of the board and chief innovation officer at Diamond Management Consultants. John has nearly 30 years of experience researching, writing, and consulting on topics of innovation, technology, strategy, and economic value. Dr. Zivlilka has global experience serving a wide variety of clients. He's also created some of the very first thought leadership pieces on the coming world of digital competition, including managing in the marketplace and exploiting the virtual value chain, both in Harvard Business Review. He's a frequent speaker on topics of innovation, growth, and emerging customer behavior. He's also a major contributor to Oxford Economic Study on Digital Megatrends 2015. He earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard College and obtained his master's and doctorate degree from Harvard Business School. He served on the Harvard Business School faculty from 1986 to 1998. Uh, John, thank you for joining us uh, for our discussion. Um, one of the places I want to start is with the exciting, uh, the interesting title of the Bionic Company and start with uh, the question of what is a Bionic Company? Absolutely, Ed. And first, let me just say thank you. I feel honored to be invited uh, and have a chance to uh, speak to this audience that obviously is not only learning, but has a lot of practical application in their day-to-day -day work. So um, thank you for having me. Um, and then, of course, I was introduced to you by my friend Denise Lee, who thinks the world of you and your work. So. Uh, I want to thank her as well. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I think that we're, um, uh, I mean, one of the great things about having been an academic uh, is that you, you get to read a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, especially in, at Harvard Business School, you read a lot of business history. And so I think, I, and I don't use, um, uh, you know, the idea of error or epic very lightly because, you know, a lot of people kind of throw it around. But I do think that we are passing from the industrial era to this bionic era. And uh, what I mean by that is that we have uh, a new informationalization, a new computability of reality that's changing the very nature of commerce. And if you caricature the industrial era, it really was about optimizing a combination of physical, uh, of human capital, of natural capital, water, energy, things like that, and financial capital. So whether it was Henry Ford or DuPont or you know, Mitsubishi or whatever. And what we have now are three new forms of capital that are being brought to us by a new combination of people and machines. And those three new forms of capital are behavioral capital, how you behave, the internet of things and so forth, the smart car, cognitive capital, that is the ability to automate more and more thinking tasks and let machines make decisions independently in groups and network capital, that is whole new networks like there's never been until Facebook, two billion people on the same platform on a regular basis. The Catholic Church was the closest at about a billion two, and they really weren't on a platform. They're all part of one organization. Um, that was the largest organization, singular organization known to the planet before Facebook. Uh, so we're really entering this bionic era and it's changing uh, competition, industry structure, and even careers. So you're talking about uh, the, the bionic company really being these new forms of capital, uh, Correct. behavior, cognitive, and network. Yes. Um, how does that change the, I guess, the skills in terms of our students who are coming out of the program? Um, what are the things that are going to be desirable? Yes. That behavioral, cognitive, and networking uh, capital. 
it, it's it's funny you say that, Ed, because the, whenever I have this conversation with friends or I give a speech on this, the first thing they ask me is, you know, what should my children or my niece or nephew study, right? I mean, it's like, they're all scared. It's like, okay, there's not going to be any jobs. How are they going to, how am I going to get them out of the house and gainfully employed? The, um, and so the, uh, I'll give you first a simple answer, then a more in-depth one. So the simple answer has got two pieces, which is anybody who can sell anything, there's always there's the, the, the ability to create new demand for something, sell somebody something, that skill will continue to be highly valued and even more highly valued. Um, so that's, that's really important. The second thing is I would say math times anything. So math times art, math times uh, marketing, math times finance, you know, because the, the, the universal language in the bionic world is mathematics, right? And it's getting more and more true all the time. Uh, more specifically, it's really about under, first understanding where value is created in your business and will that sustain over time. So, for example, I was working for um, uh, a group that happens to uh, create white goods. So, this is washing machines, um, dryers, uh, dishwashers, refrigerators, and so forth, right? And they're very, very busy doing what uh, the Internet of Things and the factory of the future, okay? The problem with that company is that they don't have any access, and they, their behavioral capital ends at the machine. And once that machine is put into a Best Buy or shipped to the customer, they have no visibility to that behavior, okay? Right. That's a problem because in the future and even in the present, uh, whether it's Nest or Amazon or somebody who lights up that machine, that is going to be the differentiator, which is how does that washing machine behave in your house? So they can use the Internet of Things and everything to, uh, to be very, very efficient inside the factory walls. But if they can't reach out and touch that asset in my house, in the near and long term, they're going to lose market power. And somebody like an Amazon or a Best Buy or if you're, if you're competing – in China, an Alibaba or a Baidu is going to substitute some other asset in there. And so you built up all this brand equity and all this expertise about how to run the Internet of Things inside your factory, but you don't have access to that behavioral capital, you're going to lose. And you see it happening with the broadcasters now as they compete with Netflix and Amazon and so forth. So it seems like there's a connection, the importance of data in terms yes. of being able to have that, but also being able to make valuable to people, to human relationships, to yes. how people act and everything that they do. Exactly. And, and, you know, I mean, so I'm sitting here with my cell phone, right? And I forget how many sensors the iPhone 7 has. Let's say it's about 15 or 20 sensors, right? This device is a, has a constant model of my behavior, right? It knows where I am, who I call, how much I move, and this, the, by taking the information on this, this is, a more, uh, this is a more unique descriptor of me than my fingerprint, right? And so, and you look and you say, okay, why is Google worth so much? Why is Facebook worth so much? And you may have seen some of the most recent reporting on Facebook. There, are, if you have 300 likes, so if you have a profile of 300 of my likes on Facebook, you can predict my preference is better than my spouse can, and I've been married 38 years. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a fact. And so what is Facebook doing? They have that behavioral capital, and then they have cognitive capital on top. They don't have to analyze those 300 data points with a human. Somebody wrote an algorithm that can analyze those 300 data points and come up with a predictive behavior. And then they have this massive network where they can deploy that, whether I'm here in Chicago visiting my kids or back home, in Newton, or I'm in Europe, or everybody, everywhere but China and Russia, Facebook can deliver that value to me. Right. And how is the, uh, how is network capital add to the success equation or to the, to the importance to the organization? Well, um, there, the thing is that network economics um, are very different than traditional economics. And I don't know how many of your students are familiar with folks like Ronald Coase and so forth, but the transaction cost theorists. Okay, uh, he's his. So think about uh, the. Let me give the abstract argument and then make it then make it concrete. So the abstract argument is that traditional uh, networks, that is, let's call them broadcast networks for a minute, um, and 
in our work, we used to call them Sarnoff networks after David Sarnoff, who was the guy who invented the, the US version of the modern radio business model. Because Ed, you will know, and some of your students may know, at the beginning of radio, people didn't know how people were gonna get paid. Were people gonna pay a subscription fee? Were the radios gonna be expensive and the content was gonna be free? Or was it gonna be used for broadcast education and it's gonna be part of a university or what? Sarnoff came along and he said, no, this is how this is gonna work. We're gonna have powerful, centralized broadcast stations. The radios will be priced as cheap as we can and nobody will pay a subscription fee. It'll be advertising driven. Okay, he made those decisions. Right. And he showed that that was the dominant model. Okay, great. That's a Sarnoff network, we call those. Now, if you go to value, and, and let's say you're an executive, back to your question about the talent, and you're an executive in, in that thing, you wanna know, how can I get more people on? How can I get more advertisers on? How can I engineer my network so it costs me the least to run it over the largest area? How can I comply with the regulators? Because there's a lot of regulation in that space, you know, the cheapest cost. How can I get the best content? How can I get Howard Stern on or whomever, right, so that I can drive audience? So those are the dynamics you have, and you have to know a lot about advertising and engineering. Now, in, in those networks are valued in direct proportion to the number of uh, people who listen to that radio network. So Rush Limbaugh's show, right, is pr the advertising on Rush Limbaugh's show is priced by a direct proportion of how many people listen to him. Okay, so if 10 million people listen to them, it's price X. If 20 million, piece, 20 million people listen to them, it's price 2X. If 5 million people listen to them, it's price 1 half X. It's a directly linear in proportion uh, to the number of subscribers, uh, listeners. So now let's go on Facebook or Twitter. The thing is that, that these new networks, these self-organizing networks, and if you were to put that into an equation, I know you have you know some engineering students here and so forth. So value equals n, right? V equals n in a in a Sarnoff or a broadcast network. Now you say to yourself, okay, let's say I have a self-organizing network like I do with Twitter. So President Trump can blast out to his 45 million or more Twitter subscribers then you and I can get together, we can hashtag things, we can self-organize, gee, we love them, we hate them, we, whatever we do, right? And on that same Twitter network now, I can get my family together, you and I and your students can all get together, you can have subgroups together. And so the value of that network is not only broadcast, V equals N, but it's also all the subgroups, right? And I, I will listen to the president on that because I can, do, I can have a direct broadcast thing, and then I can also self-organize around it, I can hashtag it, and so forth. So how do you account for that value? Well, there's a guy named David Reed, who's one of the early designers of the TCP IP protocols, which sit underneath the internet. And what David said is that network scales by two to the N, because you have each of the individual, you have all the value of a broadcast network, plus all the possible sub-self-organizations, okay? And so V equals two to the N. And if you know anything about exponents, that number goes up radically crazy fast, yeah. okay? Okay, so this is important to understand on the network stuff because it, this is why the broadcasters are trying to get more and more social activity because the social networks can do any kind of broadcast activity you want and all the self-organization. The broadcast networks, until they morph themselves onto social networks, can only do the broadcast activity. So V equals N, but for Facebook, V equals 2 to the N. Well, that is a massively better value platform, okay? So these networks, these, the ability to self-organize networks, are massively more valuable and persistent and dominant. So that's why Alibaba's not going away, Facebook's not going away, Google has had a hard time to enable the self-organizing capability of it. They really have only done it for the links, they really haven't done it for the social graph. And then, you know, um, you know somebody like Twitter, you know, has done an amazing job on the connectivity piece, but not on the functionality piece. But these networks are dominant. And so, now back to something really concrete, if you have one of these dominant networks, 
The challenge for an existing company is you can launch at scale. So Amazon, for example, uh, wanted to enter the auto parts business. Very lucrative business. Lots of people buy auto parts. You know, I love having an old, I always buy used cars, you know, like the whole routine, right? The, the, uh, the auto parts suppliers thought they were safe. The auto parts retailers, you know, AutoZone, AutoNation, those folks thought they're safe because they said, look, we have great relationships with the repair shops. We have great relationships with the manufacturers. Our clients come in. This is a complex product. You know, they need help doing it and so forth. And so they weren't worried about Amazon. Well, Amazon did two things. They went in and spent money to have build relationships with the repair shops. And, and they went back to the manufacturers and they said, look, we will give you 30%, 30% more than your current wholesale price to AutoNation and so forth. Those two things together, and by the way, we'll blast you out on our network. Those two things together brought Amazon to scale immediately across that network. So these are very, um, these are very powerful, um, you know, at scale self-organizing networks in this bionic era. And they're levered. You can deal with the, the reason Amazon can deal with that complexity is because they have the combination of cognitive and behavioral data so they can model from my book purchases and my clothing purchases and my electronics purchases, what my likely auto parts purchases are, right? And I don't even have to, they can, they can assess that before I even buy anything because they have this data. Right, and that's also an example, I think, of the, your notion of the three new forms of capital. They have the mm -hmm. data, they know their behaviors, they cognitive information, and right. they have an incredible platform network that makes right. them almost seem unbeatable. Um, right. We were talking mm -hmm. just as we were getting on here. One of the questions you asked me is, "What's the what's the hope for this?" Uh, one of the things that I see is that we've we, we're in a totally different world. Um, yes. I don't think people really appreciate how dramatic the transition is. And one of the most important things that I think you're talking about is that what's most important for organizations and work today are intangibles. Yes. And these intangibles have to do with relationships. They have to do with what do people trust. Um, who do people want to be friends with? Yes. Uh, issues of collaboration. How do you, how do you get an organization? Uh, a lot of our students deal with this notion. They're coming from these fields of technology, of sure. data, of analytics, of collaboration. And yes. one of the questions we're always talking about is how do you get a traditional organization to recognize that it's not always the things that you see and count and measure but it's, uh, it, it's what you're talking about. How do, you, how do you deal with this notion of intangibles in society? Yes, well, that's, a, that's a, great, a great question because I think that a lot, of, um, I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with the abstract, right? Uh, they're much more comfortable with the tangible. And in this world, you really have to optimize both. You have to optimize the tangible and the intangible. Uh, first, I think um, it's really important anytime that you're learning about this and certainly anytime you're describing it to go from the intangible to the tangible. So when I talk about behavioral data, I purposely pick up my phone and talk about, and someone, uh, Katrina Pugh, thank you very much. There's 16 sensors in this phone, she told me, so that's great. Um, <laughs> that I purposely pick up the phone and talk about the 16 sensors and calls and so forth because these are things that people can relate to. You know, so I, I try, I purposely try to go between a concept, behavioral capital, and an object, a phone, right? So I think that's super important. I think the other thing is that you, you, you need to simple, uh, uh, it's been said many times that um, complexity is the enemy of implementation. So I think another thing is that you need to make sure that the, the, the way you implement the abstract notions is, is, understandable and simple. So, you know, I head up US marketing for PwC for the $13 billion, you know, US firm. And you can imagine there's lots of people who in the marketing field, you have to measure stuff, right? You have to show the return on investment, then you have to show sentiment, then you have to show frequency and all that other stuff. And if you think about our marketing challenge, being PwC, having been in business 163 years, and served every single large company on the planet, either currently or at one time or another, there is no way to isolate just the effect of marketing because I'm not introducing somebody to the brand or to my partners or to whatever, right? There's an existing relationship there. So from a cause standpoint, I can never claim total cause was this marketing activity. Right. 
right? It's always a much more complex uh, causal model, right? Uh, and so what we have done is that we've tried to keep it very simple. Now our margins are, are good. And so I established a conservative margin. I said, look, let's just take a very conservative margin that everybody's comfortable with, which is a 25% contribution margin. And then I said, for any marketing activity, we usually know our out-of-pocket costs. How much, did, how much media do we buy? How much the room cost to rent? How much food do we spend? All that stuff, right? We, you can imagine we're an accounting firm, we account for that stuff, right? Then there's soft dollar cost. There's the, co the fully loaded cost of labor. So labor plus benefits, blah, blah, blah. So let's say that's $100 an hour. So now when somebody says, well, did we make any money? What was the ROI? return on investment for that marketing expenditure. The first question my folks, I hope, <laughs> ask is, okay, well, we spent 100,000 bucks on the promotion, the room, and the follow-up, and the expenses of people running around, coming to the meeting. Um, and we had about 1,000 hours worth of labor, so that's another 100,000 bucks. So we spent 200,000 fully loaded, out of pocket, plus labor on this thing. And, did we generate four times that, that is $800,000 in revenue that without the event, we wouldn't have generated because that gets us to break even at 25%, right? So yes, it's a complex thing that you need to measure. No, you really can't measure it causally. Yes, you can go down a rabbit hole trying to tr track ROI, but if you step back and you make the intangible marketing tangible, gee, we spent 200 grand, do we get 800,000 in incremental revenue we otherwise wouldn't have gotten or not? You can, you can get a, a clear, simple, tangible indicator of a complex phenomenon that can guide managerial action. So it's reckon we were talking also about, uh, it's a knowledge economy from the standpoint of all these things that you're talking about, the data, the behaviors, the- yes. Uh, cognitive capabilities, the social relationships uh, are part of this. And, but you can, you can try to understand it by setting you know, basic measures, uh, by recognizing that you're not gonna get the outcome, but you can get an intermediate. And, uh, and uh, you can start designing in a way that gets you closer to, to the success you're, you're looking for. Absolutely. And, and, and you can also have experienced judgment sit in the middle. Don't let people drag you down a rabbit hole and say, oh, well, you know, we're not 100% sure that that was the cause. It's like, well, wait a second. Uh, we used to, when I used to teach decision analytics, we had this, um, we had this exercise, which, which was the expected value of perfect information. So before we go get the data, do the decision tree and tell me if you had perfect information on that variable, how much would it change your decision and what would it be worth to you? And so do the same thing here, which is to say, somebody says to you, hey, we have to measure the living daylights. I would say, great, but before we go do that, if we measure it perfectly, what will we do differently if the data comes out this way or comes out that way? And if the number isn't at least 10 times different between what it's gonna cost you to measure it, and what the decision is, then you're just running, then somebody's just trying to basically stall from supporting what you're doing, right? They're just trying to, you and I have both been around people who use data, you know, data wars, right? People who throw analytics as a stalling tactic. So, so you have to make reasonable decisions. We do the same thing in PwC marketing, which is to say, look, some, I can't tell you, you know, in the universe, down to the universe of atoms that, you know, we wouldn't have gotten that $800,000 without that $200,000 spend. But I got two partners who stand up and say, yes, this was instrumental and critical to winning that work. Well, that's enough, right? right. And, and so I, I think that's a really important thing. I think well, the other thing, no, sorry. Great leadership, common sense. So yeah. when I was at NASA, obviously a lot went into the development of the learning of the different communities, the engineers, the project managers. And uh, you're not going to say because of the learning that led to the mission successes, but right. obviously it's a key, you know, factor. So that's how we have to think about these things of maybe how it contributes and working off of the relationship with the leaders to gain. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I, you know, I grew up in Brockton, Mass, in an old shoe town. You know, three of my four grandparents came and worked there and stuff. And the, the I always do the wallet test, which is, would you spend your money on it? 
you know, when you spend your money to go find that information, if you're investing your money to do whatever X, Y, Z is, and, you know, and learning at NASA, you know, if, if, if you've been your money, I bet you would have spent the money on knowledge development because you know how critical that is. And there's certain marketing things that, you know, we do that I would spend the money on and others we've killed because we wouldn't. And uh, so I think there's that kind of thing. I think there's a deeper thing too, which is, you said it a couple of times before, which is you have to start looking at the world in a bionic way. And what I mean by that is to understand the behaviors. Now, one concept I think that's useful is digital exhaust. Okay, so what's your digital exhaust? Like you're doing task A and as a byproduct, you get all B, C, D, E, and F. So, for example, let's say that this particular white goods manufacturer did, in fact, light up those, when I say light up, connect up, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 homes with their washing machines, very much the way Alexa is doing now in, you know, with Amazon, right? You, have, you not only have the core information, now you have information about you know, what time of day people, um, you know, do their laundry, you know, what the relation, depending upon the senses you have it, what kinds of brands do they use? How often do they switch? What are the consumption patterns, right? These are all new forms of information. You might have motion sensors. How much are people actually in the laundry room or where is it in the house and so forth? And these things start to give you benefits. So for example, there's a company called For Sale by Owner which is um, it's basically about eight to 10% of the US housing market is uh, sold, but not through agents, but individuals selling their own houses. Okay, it's called FISBO, for sale by owner, right? Well, when you uh, list your house for sale, you take lots of pictures in it. So I'm looking at you know, your office, you're looking at my office, and I see, you know, you have the challenge traditions is on the left-hand side. You've got this nice tchotchke on top of your, you know, um, uh, your, uh, you know, filing cabinet and so forth. Hmm? Actually printed moon. Oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. So, and so imagine doing that for your whole house. Well, now I have a pretty good inventory of all the furniture in your house, right. of all the fixtures in your house of all the doors in your house, of all the carpets in your house, right? So that's just a natural digital exhaust of somebody putting their house up for sale. Well, if you organize that, that's got great value. And it, by the way, it's geographically constrained. And if you also know anything about how people move, when somebody moves their house, one in six Americans move every year, right? Move some location. And within 18 months of when they move, they, if they buy something, they spend 20% of the value of that home on furnishings and other things. So I spend a million bucks on a house, I spend 200 grand on furnishings, right? Within an 18 month window. Well, now you start to put that together and you say, oh my goodness, if I know somebody's moving from X to Y and they're coming into Y location or they're coming to Chicago, they're spending a million bucks, I know what they used to have in their old house and what's going to get moved and so forth. I know they're going to spend 200 grand within 18 months. That's incredibly valuable information. And that all just comes off the digital exhaust of paying attention to what happens when somebody lists their house. You know, so now again, this is behavioral data. Now I can start putting algorithms against that for cognitive data. And if I can do it across hundreds of thousands or millions of houses, I now have network. Right. Right. And so, so you're think, designing this new bionic company in, in, in essence by, by the integration of, of the networking, right. the cognitive and the, the behavior. Right. And paying attention to the digital exhaust, I'm not just thinking, okay, I've got this data to list my house on the internet. I've got these secondary, that's purpose A, but I've got purpose B, C, D, and E that are natural byproducts of that if I'm paying attention to it. There's a, here's a great, a great new, um, uh, company out of uh, San Francisco. It's called uh, B Omni, B E O M N I. And what they do is your stuff in the cloud. Okay, started by this 28 year old entrepreneur. And so I don't know about you, but like in my house in, in Newton, Mass., we've got 10 chairs, okay, uh, dining room chairs. Okay, we can comfortably fit like eight, okay. The other two kind of hang around. When do we use them? Christmas and Easter and an occasional family gathering. But, you know, so they get used literally three days a year, right? 
And so if B omni was in Newton, what I can do is that I, I happen to live in a big old Victorian, so we got plenty of room, it's not an issue. But most people, you know, have too much stuff or whatever. Or you have your bike, you know, you're in a, a you're in a city apartment, you get your bike, or you get your digital camera that you only use when you go someplace. Or like in my case, my wife bought a chocolate fountain. How often do you use a chocolate fountain? You know, whatever, right? And so what you can do is you call up beyond or you take a picture of it and you give them a window when you need it. And if you give them lots of notice and you don't change, they give you a very cheap storage price. And as long as a single human can pick it up comfortably and take it away, they will store anything for you that's not, you know, dangerous, right? right. So that's cool, right? So, you know, urban living, the whole routine, your bike, you know. Now, the even cooler thing is that you can rent it while it's in the cloud. So if you want to rent your kayak or rent your bike or rent your chocolate fountain or rent your chairs, you can rent it when it's in the cloud. And so, and of course they put it around, you know, when you actually need it. So how cool is that? And that is a perfect example of how you go straight from, gee, um, I can use this network effect of my phone. And when the kid first gets started, it turns out that some of these food delivery services like Grubhub, I don't know for sure about Grubhub, but like them, don't, they have very thin margins. They're kind of struggling. So they're looking for any incremental uh, revenue. So what this kid did is before he built out his own reverse logistics network, he actually called, had the Grubhub folks. He'd say, hey, look, after you deliver that pizza at you know, 4th and Main, go over to 10th and, and G and pick up two dining room chairs, right? To prove out the concept. And now he's building it out but it's your stuff in the cloud. And, uh, and, and then again, he's got a European insurer who insures the stuff. And then you start going back to the thing I was saying before about for sale by owner. So, okay, now you've got all these products coming in. You've got all this information about the quality of the products. You know, their you know, their demand patterns, you know, who uses them, you know, who rents them, right? You now have a whole over the counter market and stuff that nobody else has is a digital byproduct, as digital exhaust from the convenience of giving yourself more room for the two chairs you only use three days a year. Yeah. So it's, it's um, well, it's, it's, we see that it's part of that whole knowledge sharing. We see it in essence in things like Airbnb in terms of Uber. You don't really need a car in many right. cases. You don't need the, you know, the chocolate fountain. You need it, you know, three times a year and the rest of the time, maybe you're bringing in more money than, you know, than you ended up paying for it. So it's all, it's, it, again, it's, it's this extension of knowledge in so many different ways. Absolutely. And, you know, and I have a buddy who's, who um, is helping. Uh, it turns out that it, in, in many cities, certainly in the, in the Northeast, if you help utilities improve efficiency, they get certain tax credits. So he's doing outside in building analysis, taking, um, you know, uh, infrared and other spectrum analyses of the buildings, putting that together with patterns of weather and traffic, and then uh, analyzing from the outside in how efficient a building is. Then he's got methodologies. So that's kind of a, you know, an environmental exhaust, if you will, literally. And he's got methodologies that then can assess, he can, he can go in and ask, okay, what is the HVAC system that you have? And looks at the glass footprint and what happens with the sun and all that other stuff. And he can suggest improvements. Right. And, and then in addition to that, he's starting to head toward a micro market trading architecture for energy in those. Right. And because he knows the micro variations in demand of things like home heating oil based on these profiles. Right. So, again, information exhaust, just, you know, it's just and we're just at the beginning of this. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that we're just at the beginning, this is one of the things uh, we've talked about our program, Information Knowledge Strategy Columbia. It's been in place for about eight years. Uh, and we have wonderful students and they're in, in really great places. One of the issues that usually comes up uh, is how do you describe, you know, what their, their skills are in terms of jobs? Because a lot of the jobs there today aren't there. Uh, they're students who are doing things in terms of designing platforms around technology and applications. Uh, mm -hmm. developing the data and the ana uh, analytics to be able to, uh, for predictive capabilities and understanding and seeing trends of uh, sure. collaboration. So how do you, 
I mean, what jobs do you see out there for, do they get advertised? Are, are these things that are being created by entrepreneurs? How do you, how do we define what this field is? Sure. Well, I think that um, I would say there's at, at, at least um, four domains of job creation. One is to, um, it's in a direct application of these at the leading companies. So, you know, if you're, if you're good at analytics and, you know, you can do multimodal modeling, so you, not just machine learning, but statistical analysis and Bayesian, you know, like the whole shebang, right? You're just in demand, right? And you're in demand at the technology companies. You're, uh, I mean, I'm sitting here, you know, right near the Chicago Board of Exchange. You're in demand at the Chicago Board of Exchange, right? You're in demand, you're in demand anywhere where there's high economic leverage of using analytics, right? And that right now is most acute in finance and technology and uh, military may not get paid as well, but have lots of authority, military and, and, and um, you know, national security, right? You're kind of worth your weight in gold in those domains, right? Um, and in some places you get paid in gold, other places you get paid in power, right? Um, so uh, there's that. Then there's, then there are a tremendous, there are tons of market leaders who have real, they may not call it this, but have realized they have to do this bionic transformation. So why did Walmart buy Jet, Jet.com for $3 billion? They're trying to become more bionic, right? They look at Amazon and say, look, we have to understand how to organize around the customer, not around supply. Because the fundamental thing that's different in the bionic world is that in the industrial world, the supply was the fixed point and the customer moved to the supply. I go to the bank, I go to the merchandise mart, I go to the steel company, I go to the lumber yard. In the bionic world, it's like, tell me where the customer is and I will organize around that customer need. So you see Amazon now, you know, if you get a GM car, you give them uh, with OnStar, uh, all the GM cars have OnStar, you give them a code, they can open your trunk, put your, put your package in your trunk. Right, that's organizing around the customer, and um, and you also see it. It's very hard to describe the fully bionic companies. What business is Amazon in? Right, the industrial categories don't hold. Right. Same with Alibaba. Same with Baidu. Right. Um, so you you know that you're dealing with a bionic company when you can't tell what industry it's in. Okay. So our students are bionic students then. Awesome. That's <laughs> yeah. It's uh, well, it, it, it's it's exciting. It's also challenging because I was I was in India just earlier this week, and I was talking to many of these organizations, and they have the same problem, right? Because uh, they recognize dramatic changes in terms of knowledge, in terms of the, the the major issue being collaboration. How do you get people within an organization to collaborate effectively? And as right. uh, you know, obviously the analytics, and yet a lot of it has shifted again to this area of. Uh, you're creating something new that isn't there yet. Yes. Companies that are comfortable with that go in that direction. Those that are scared uh, yes. don't and make it difficult. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to uh, maybe ask one more question and then. Uh, Can I just finish the other two, two hunks of that? So those are the two. And then the, 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 the third one is there'll be a tremendous amount of value in chopping up the, the, the zombie companies. So the companies that don't make the bionic transformation will right. be chopped up and reprocessed, right? Whether that's through private equity or whatever. So, you know, you look at retail space right now, people are gonna make fortunes redoing the excessive amount of retail space we have in the US. Right. So, so, so not working for the retailers, but working for the reprocessors of that retail space. Right. And then the fourth thing is, there'll be people who figure out secondary effects of things like uh, beyond, right? So the secondary effects of putting your stuff in the cloud probably mean that there's some kind of opportunity to reuse uh, local trucks in a way that hasn't been done before. Somebody's gonna create that brokerage to do that. So it's just like the people who understood that the Xerox machine was gonna radically increase the use of paper, right? There are some people who thought the office is gonna go paperless. More smarter investors said, no, 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 no this is gonna increase the use of paper. And so they made the bets on recycling or on paper distribution or whatever and made a fortune. So those four areas at the core, transforming, reprocessing and secondary effects are where the jobs are gonna be. Yeah, so there'll be more jobs. 
because uh, what you're talking about, if you have a technology base, a digital base, uh, an ability to work with people and pull concepts together and sell ideas, right. um, that's a primary thing. Uh, you'll have organizations going in to create the bionic company, so they're going to need skills to help right. get into that place. Right. Uh, you know, the, the new effects of being creative and figuring out new spinoffs. And one that uh, that's kind of fascinating, the, the notion of the zombie organizations, right. these firms that just aren't going to be able to change and what what takes place of of their residue, I guess. So. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like bankruptcy attorneys writ large, right? You're the reorganizer. There's going to be more of that kind of company reprocessor, if you will. You're kind of like the recycling folks for companies, right? And, and then you have secondary effects. Yeah, no, so that's, so that, yeah, that should make us feel good. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more opportunity than, than not, but it's a major transition because the, these things are obviously so new. Um, yes. Let me go to Carolina because I can't see uh, the chat, so I can't see if there's any questions uh, and see if I have any questions from any of the students that are being written in the chat. And, uh, and uh, so Carolina, do we have anything there? If not, I want to spend, I want to spend in any case a little bit of time on the book which I found sure. fascinating, the self-made billionaire effect, because I think it's, it's very, it's different, but it's very connected to the things we're talking about. Uh, Carol? Yeah. yeah, hi, Ed. We don't have anything just yet, so um, I'll encourage the participants to put their questions in the chat box, and then I'll read them out loud if we get any. Okay. Um, so let me, before we go to the self-made billionaire effect, which uh -huh. I think is a phenomenal book, and a, uh, I want to talk about that. Um, so our students are usually put in the situation of they are typically mid-career uh, yes. uh, and they're usually in management positions and they're usually trying to put together the knowledge, they're, put, the, they're pulling together the, the bionic uh, company, as you would say it. Yes. What tips do you have for how do you design or in your place, how do you get a place like PwC, which is a traditional organization? Sure. How do you get it? Uh, how do you start designing the principles yes. of what we've been talking about? Are there any anything you can suggest? Yes, absolutely. I, I think the really important thing is to link the transformation to your history. So when I talk about these things inside PwC, it's like we've always been a data analytics company. I mean, what is accounting? What is tax compliance? What is, you know, uh, due diligence on deals in our advisory business, right? If it's not data analytics, right? Uh, we were early to automate. You know, we have unbelievable tools and audit and the tax and so forth, you know. We've always been leading a knowledge worker. So just the way when Bill Gates came back from Cornell and said, well, the internet is part of the desktop, and he went out and bought that company that became Internet Explorer. He didn't say, look, the internet is a separate activity. He said the internet is part of the desktop. And I think a critical thing is to link whatever you're doing to the core. So, you know, if one of your students is working for an automobile company right now, you'll see it certainly in like GM in particular, you know, they characterize themselves as a mobility company. Okay. So that's, and it's easy to buy these, uh, you're building cars on the path to mobility. You're not a car company or a mobility company. Um, you know, if you're working for one of these, you know, white goods manufacturers, you know, you're not a washing machine company, right? You're, you're a clothes cleaning company, right? So you attach to the outcome for that end customer. And then you make it, then I think you have to go from the theoretical Look, here's the real of what's going on to the very practical. This is what it means for us today. So, so for us in marketing PwC, the, the relative cost of having a voice in social media is much cheaper than traditional media. And I can show you engagement metrics that our buyers engage better. So if I measure traditional media active cost activation and effectiveness, I can show you why we need to be there in a very tangible sense. So that, you mentioned two things, which I think, and it, it relates. Uh, so when I was at NASA, there's many changes that people were uncomfortable with. One of the most, one of the biggest was when they were shutting down the shuttle program after 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is how to transition to that. And 
we talked back to our history of we've gone through this before, even mm -hmm. at the end of Apollo. So you turn back to the history, the connections, the heritage of the organization, and how do you leverage that for, for the new journeys, uh, as well as it sounds like being very, uh, very applied in terms of how is this going to help us be successful specifically? Yes. I think at times of great transition, people worry that they're losing their essence. And when people feel that they worry that, that the organization is losing its essence, they get very uh, uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Well, it's fearful. I mean, that's why I think a lot of the things you know, tie into the notion of organizational leadership courage uh, in terms of, uh, you know, one response to, to, to tremendous change is to try to not see it. Right. Which probably leads you towards that zombie phenomenon. Uh, the yes. others uh, step up and say, okay, let's figure out how we, how we move forward. Um, I wanted to... Ed, we have one question. Okay, go ahead. We have a question from Madeline. It says, what's your experience in the length of time to make the transformation? Thanks, Madeline. Um, the, if, there, if the organization is under duress, it's usually, and you know, so are they you know, going to go bankrupt or whatever? It's usually um, 18 months to two years. If the organization uh, is led by the founder, you can have that same quick turnaround happen uh, even if the company is healthy. If you look at Facebook's transition from a desktop company to a mobile company, it took them about 18 months. If you look at the ad revenue, what the percentage of ad revenue was, it was they were 70 or 80% desktop. 18 months later, they were 70 to 80% mobile. But that's because they're still founder led. So the founder can do that kind of pivot when the organization is healthy. If you're in a healthy organization that has outlived its founder or the founder has sold it off to someone else, I think it takes um, a minimum of three years and usually five years with great leadership. And the reason for that is it takes three years to build trust and one year to kill trust. And the reason it takes three years is that the senior leadership looks at the compensation. And so somewhere, some significant subset, 20 to 30% or whatever, will sign on to the new thing the first year. Then, you know, 50, 60% of people sit on the sidelines and say, look, is Ed serious or is Ed just from corporate trying to help me here? Whatever, right? And He's, it's coming out of his mouth, but he's not really going to reward the new behavior. Then if you reward the new behavior, and most compensation is year, year by year. If you reward the new behavior, you get another 40, 50% of people to sign on. So now you're up at 60, 70% of your leadership. And then the third year, and, and the second year, you punish the people who aren't with the program. And then the third year, you show again that you do it and you fire the people who aren't with the program. And by then, you're, so you're three years in. And you need the compensation cycle to show that whatever the rhetoric is, is going to be reflected in the compensation system of the organization. So it sounds like one of the key components of an intangible bionic kind of company is patience. And, yes. And because and, and, uh, people are so used to hearing about changes, they wait it out. Yeah. I always used to say at NASA, there was a 12 to 18 month cycle where mm -hmm. people take their heads in agreement, but uh, many many new ideas would be stomped out in that time frame because they would just kill the funding by that year and a half. So yeah. To see if, are you still alive after two years? Exactly. And, and, and the, the other thing is, in fairness to the folks in the middle, a lot of times senior executive teams believe that they have communicated when they've communicated down one or maybe two levels. Right. And most complex organizations are five to seven levels or more. And so a, a good measure you can do is you can actually go down into the organization and see how clear the message is, how deep into the organization it is, is a great indicator. Uh, and so those people, I think, are rational to sit back for 18 months or two years. Yeah, that was a it, smart strategy. Yeah. I, uh, again, NASA's story was when they had me, after Challenger, it was to set up a learning initiative. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't get one of our centers to sign up. And a year goes by, a year and a half goes by, I get a call from some of the folks about two years in saying we're ready to support the, the program. And right. being naive, I said, oh, you see the value of it now. And the person on the other end said, no, we thought you'd be gone by now. Which <laughs> yeah, is right. Good. So, so yeah. much. Yeah. So there, there's, there's yeah. This, what you're talking about. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes. And uh, I mentioned that uh, as, as we were getting ready for this, obviously, 
the article that we're talking about is the Bionic Company in uh, a February uh, this year's issue of Strategy and Business, yes. uh, which lays out your ideas of the Bionic Company, which are fascinating, which are right, right on target. Uh, we also got a copy of your book that's only a couple of years out, uh, yes. which is The Self-Made Billionaire Effect, How Extreme Producers Create Massive Value. Yes. And I love the book. It wasn't what from the title I thought it would be because I, you know, the title, you know, I, I know I'm not going to be a billionaire. I figured that one out. Um, but really to me, what the book is about is what does it take to be very successful yes. in, in, in a world that's changed? Um, so what's an extreme producer? Yes. Why were you interested in studying this coming from PwC? Well, it was, it was interesting. It was from PwC and also, um, you know, my, my background, you know, I've been in and around large organizations and, you know, studying them, teaching about them, uh, consulting to them and so forth, pretty much my whole adult life. And I had never really studied up close and personal the individuals who created these massive organizations. So that was really the curiosity. It's like, okay, a lot of people have studied success. Nobody's kind of studied it from this angle. Uh, and I was just curious. Uh, and I also just wanted an excuse to go, you know, hack around and, you know, meet these jokers, right, as well. Um, and I thought, well, that could be interesting. So, um, and it was fun. And the thing that we discovered, and a, a lot of the things you hear are not true about, you know, gee, it's the first child or it's the middle child or it's the person who grew up poor or the person who started rich or, you know, the person uh, or the, the high-tech billionaire. It turns out that I think for me the most striking finding of the book was that four out of five of these self-made billionaires made their money in highly mature competitive markets. And so Howard Schultz didn't invent the coffee shop, right? But he brought together a series of innovations that differentiated both the customer experience as well as his supply chain, his marketing, and, you know, his, and, and also his capital structure. Uh, in a way that created a massively successful new experience. And so that says to me, anybody who's working for an existing company, there's growth potential in your market. It's just that you haven't looked at it the right way. In other words, whatever situation you're in, you can make it dramatically better. Uh, you talk about how they have habits of the mind. Yes. One of the things I loved about the book, it, it's probably it wasn't what I expected because usually these books say the things you kind of know. Yes. And uh, interesting uh, chapter on risk. That yes. What we thought is that these billionaires were just crazy risk takers and they hit it after failing. And, and what she said, not quite, is that they're taking smart, making smart decisions. Yes. Uh, that actually not doing something for them would have been the dumb move, you know, yes. on the data that they had. And you, you, you cite the work of Kahneman. But can you talk a little bit about the habits of the mind of these, uh, these high producers? Sure. And, and let's go to the risk one first. There, so there are five habits of mind we talk about. One is uh, this notion of rational risk taking. And it, if you study economics, especially at the firm level, not at the neoclassical you know, market equilibrium level, but actually how wealth is created either for a company, a country, or, a, uh, or an individual, what you find is it's a massively skewed distribution, right? And what, so, you know, you know, the stories about if, uh, if height was, if wealth was height, Bill Gates' head would hit the moon, right? And so these, and this is not how most people think, right? Most people naturally think of things like weight and height, and these are naturally, you know, natural distributions, right? They're not skewed distributions. So we're not, and, and very little of it, the education system, unless you have a really good education, teaches you about skewed distributions and how to think about them. So consequently, most people, uh, most people's behavior is not rational concerning risk. Like the folks on this, uh, I bet there are more of your students who right now have life insurance policies who don't have uh, disability policies, but they are 10 times as likely to be disabled as to die. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, so it's, I have a disability policy, by the way, even though I'm 60. Uh, uh, and so that's a perfect example of people don't understand how to think about a skewed distribution, right? Um, and so, uh, so, and I'm, I'm not a broker, but go get yourself a disability policy if you're listening to this broadcast, okay? Um, the, um, uh, 
the, so the billionaires aren't like that. They say, look, if I'm playing a game where I might win big, my biggest issue is not whether I win and lose every time, but can I play again? So if I, if I can get into the game without getting blown out, then, uh, and some people do that, like Mark Cuban does it completely with bootstrapping. Other people do it with other people's money so they get a piece of it or whatever. Uh, and it's the rare individual who's like Musk where he's constantly all in with all his fortune all the time. But even if you look at him, even if he blew through, even if SpaceX craters, Tesla craters, uh, you know, uh, solar city craters, neural lace craters, foreign, at all craters, you'll still be able to go out and raise $10 billion tomorrow, right? Uh, so he really, even if he's all in, he's really not because he's got the chance to play again because of who he is. And so that was cool. The other things were um, most people separate, most corporations separate out thinking from doing, not true of the billionaires, what we call, uh, you know, um, um, uh, inventive execution. So how you do it is as important as what you do. Uh, and you see this, um, you see this again and again in terms of the customer experience is if you try to separate thinking from execution, a lot of times the customer experience gets watered down in the execution. Uh, we had this notion of uh, empathetic imagination, which is really understanding the emotional drivers as well as the rational drivers. Um, and then this notion of uh, patient urgency, which is you have a domain you're curious about. Organizations have a hard time paying attention to stuff without spending a lot of money on it. But there are many things they should be paying attention to while spending a little bit of money and timing, because being early or being, uh, being late or early is as bad as being wrong. And so patient urgency is really about paying attention to important trends like for PwC, for example, blockchain is one of those things we need to be patiently urgent about. We need to understand it, but it's gonna be a while before blockchain actually becomes part mainstream on many of our clients and so forth, but we have to be knowledgeable about it. So we have to figure out how we pay attention without spending tons of dough. Because if we spend a lot of dough, we'll say, okay, not ready, we'll put it away and not pay attention, which is not the right answer. Right. And then we have this notion of producer performers, which is that decide are you the kind of person who can creatively put together these new things in a new way? Or do you love working with those kinds of people? Because you may not be Michael Bloomberg, but if you're Tom Segunda and you're working with Michael Bloomberg, Mike may be worth 30 billion, you're worth five. That's a good day. Yeah, right. And if he was working at Citibank by himself, he ain't gonna be worth $5 billion. If he's working with Michael Bloomberg, he is. And the thing that, that I, again, I, I think the book matches so nicely is that it's almost that use of the different, uh, you know, capital areas that you're talking about. Uh, there's the empathy uh, in terms of that, you know, you don't often think about, but the fact that there's a connection to what people want. Uh, the fact that you have to have the ability to execute, you know, these imaginative uh, possibilities. I mean, we see people who have ideas, but they don't have a clue in terms of how to execute and how to make the project a reality. Uh, right. And that integrative thinking the duality of being able to see different things at the same time. And then, uh, you know, the whole risk, I think, I think is fascinating because we tend to, in general, and this is a lot of the Kahneman work that, that, that you talk about is uh, we often don't take the risk that, you know, logically we should, and yet we, we're risky on, on other things. So it's a fascinating, you know, work and it, uh, it, it's something that the, the students will hear us talking about and, and see in the class. Sure, and if folks, if folks are interested, uh, you just go to pwc.com forward slash billionaire. There's a number of articles and media and so forth that folks can get access to. Uh, One more time, John, pwc.com forward slash billionaire. Okay. And, and we have, you know, we were interviewed on TV a bunch and there's some shorter articles and, uh, and you know, pointers to materials and some of the interviews, some of the interview material with billionaires yeah. up there. When I picked it up, it was just to get some insights on the bad company. And then that books, I came up with all these questions just on that. Yeah. So I had to go back. So it's, uh, you, wow. you're both an uh, original thinker and, a, and uh, obviously uh, very smart in terms of everything you're seeing and doing. Clearly, yeah, have fun. Yes. So, yeah. uh, Carolina, any, uh, any questions before we close out? I know we're a couple of minutes over, but uh, I wanted to extend it a little bit. Uh, nothing on the chat box, Ed. Very good. We worked the time. Uh, John, anything that you wanted to bring up that? Uh... 
Um, I just, um, I, I really, um, I just uh, would encourage everybody to have um, a gratitude practice because we really are, like there's a lot of craziness going on, whatever your politics are, you know, there's a lot of nuttiness happening in the world. Um, I think that the news, I think the news media and so forth, uh, because they're now profit centers are way more negative than the economic and, and social reality. That things are actually, uh, you know, this huge opportunity, uh, you know, and, and I think we've never seen the access to capital, talent, markets, and a peacetime kind of dividend that we have, uh, that any generate, anybody who's living in the United States is, is sitting in a more peaceful, more prosperous, more opportunity laden uh, environment than has been true uh, since the Second World War. And, um, and regardless of what the newspapers say and all that other stuff, that is an economic fact and you know be grateful what you have and if you want more it's right there in front of you to have the right attitude i think in relation to that the, the thing that i see often missing and again i've been talking about this over and over again is we see the power of the analytics and the data we see the power of the technology and the platforms you talked about gratitude i don't think we often think about the human aspect of the strengths that we have which is that all this happens with collaboration it happens with effective conversation it mm -hmm. happens when you know, we take the proper leaders, the, the, the empathic aspect of things we often I don't think think about in organizations or, or the ones that have problems don't think about it, I think. Yes, so. and, 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 more, and more cynically, if you ever read, uh, if you ever listen to the work of David Goggins, he's this crazy, uh, you know, um, extreme athlete, Navy SEAL, three time through death, you know, whatever, Hell Week and all that other stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he said something which really sticks with me, which he said, look, so many people in this economy are so used to, um, you know, getting trophies for everything that if you have the least bit of mental toughness, you will stand out. So I would recommend that as well. Yeah. No, this has been, I knew coming in just from all the stuff is uh, phenomenal. I hope we continue the relationship with, with the program. Love to. Capacity, I think, in terms of the research and ideas. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Denise Lee. Denise is yes, thank you. a partner back to NASA and a friend. We continue to work together. And he's the one that you got to speak to John. And uh, how thrilled. Carolina really did a lot of the setup things uh, while I was in India, getting things going. And I also want to thank Sam for uh, for making sure everything with Zoom technically uh, uh, happened. And of course, the, uh, the students and uh, you know, Valerie and the community that we have in terms of pulling these things together, greatly, greatly appreciate it. And I thank you all. Uh, and John, I thank you so much. This has been tremendous. John, Thanks, do, you, do you, are you open to follow up questions? If yes, no question. Yep, absolutely. Be delighted to. Okay. Should they reach out to you directly? Should we compile yep. questions? How do you, okay. okay. Uh, whatever you guys normally do, I'm happy with either. Uh, you know, the, the best email is going to yeah. be John, john at spiepla.com. Okay. Uh, we have your Great. email. We can get that. The other thing, it may be easier to. If there's there's questions from the community, let's pull it together and get it to John. And that can be part of uh, hopefully a continuity uh, in terms of research and uh, and ideas we have with with our program and and you, John. Be delighted to. Thanks, Ed. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Carolina. Thank you. Carolina. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.